Добрый вечер. Слава Украина! It is very good to be back in Kiev. It is a city, the more often I come here, the more I like it. When I first came here 27 years ago, I did not like it very much, but now I like it much, much more. Now, I thought today I would talk a little bit more philosophically about medicine rather than about how to cut people's heads open. Um, and I'm talking about medicine and money. And I'll talk about two, two perspectives. Firstly, the cost and effectiveness of healthcare systems as a whole. We all know the healthcare system in Ukraine is in a terrible mess and has been for many years. And then secondly, I want to talk about the problems we face as doctors. How much money should we make? How do doctors find a balance between medicine as a vocation and medicine as a business to make money? So if you look at the world perspective, the coffee business is worth 100 billion. That's an American billion, which is 1,000 million is worth $100 billion. The arms trade is worth $100 billion US dollars. And medicine is seven to eight trillion. And almost half of that actually is spent in America. So the healthcare business is probably the biggest business in the world. And in Ukraine, for comparison, the, the national income, gross domestic product in economic language, is $112 billion dollars a year. So it is a middle, a middle income country. Now healthcare costs all over the world are going up. As you can see here, in America, the yellow line, they're going up much more steeply than anywhere else. And I'll talk a little bit more later about the strengths and weaknesses of the American healthcare system. But everywhere healthcare costs are going up, and everywhere apart from Estonia, the red diamonds are the rate of growth of healthcare costs over the last 20 years. And the blue lines, the blue bars, are the economic growth rate. So you can see everywhere, apart for some reason from Estonia, the growth, the increase in healthcare costs is growing more quickly than the wealth of countries. So in other words, a larger and larger part of the national economy is being devoted to healthcare. In America, which is the most expensive healthcare system in the world, it is now about 20% of, of the country's economic activity goes into healthcare. Um, and as you can see here, although these figures are now slightly out of date, Ukraine here spends much, much less money than the other European countries. It is a smaller percentage of national income and in absolute terms as well. So Ukraine really does not spend very much money compared to most European countries and some you know, comparative companies like countries like Poland and Latvia. Um, and it is, it is a problem. Now, why are healthcare costs going up? Why is it becoming more and more expensive. Um, in England, when the National Health Service, the government health service was started in 1947, people really thought it would save money. Everybody would become so healthy, but it would cost less money. But of course, the opposite is the case. The more you spend on healthcare, the more it costs. And the first reason is people live longer. And growing old is an expensive business, because the longer we live, the more likely we are to get cancer, and the more likely we are to suffer dementia, Alzheimer's disease, diseases like that. Old age is not always, a long life is not always a good thing. And there are more chronic illnesses, particularly diabetes, alcoholism, cigarette smoking, things like that. Technology is becoming more and more expensive, particularly for treating cancer and the cost of oncological drugs. And now I know in Ukraine, um, a larger and larger part of the healthcare budget is going on cancer drugs. 
and in some countries, not yet in Ukraine, litigation, suing doctors is a big business and increasing a lot. And then you have waste, and a big problem in modern medicine, and it is a problem also in Ukraine, is overtreatment. Patients having unnecessary operations, having unnecessary drug treatments. And I'll talk more about that. And then finally, and particularly in Ukraine, there is a problem of corruption, and particularly in the procurement of drugs and medical equipment in the government sector. That shows how healthcare costs go up as you get older. In most of the modern world, between the ages of 10 and 60, there's a slight increase. It then goes up a bit more. And America, which is a crazy country, you can see it goes up into space, into orbit. And we'll talk about why that is a, such a problem in America later. This um, are figures for Britain, for the United Kingdom. It shows on the x-axis, that's 1850. This is 2050. It shows if you live to the age of 65, how many more, how many more years would you probably live? And in 1850, if you lived to 65, you would live another 10 to 11 years. Now, round about here, you can see how there's been a big, big change. And now if you, make, if you reach the age of 65, you probably will live another 20 years, which is why in most European countries, the pension system is in crisis. People have, in the past, once people retired, usually at the age of 65 or so, they dropped dead and they did not cost more money. Now they live another 20 years and they have pensions and it is the young people who are working who have to generate the money and the wealth to pay the old people's pensions. And this is a big, big problem in many modern countries. That's um, Ukraine. And as you can see, life expectancy, unlike most um, middle-income countries, life expectancy in Ukraine has not really changed. It dropped a bit in the early years after independence, but there has been remarkably little progress in life expectancy in Ukraine. And we'll discuss reasons for that later. And that shows how, on the other hand, um, if you are wealthy, if you're a high-income Ukrainian, your life expectancy is pretty similar to, say, in Poland. But for most people in Ukraine, life expectancy is much lower. This phenomenon that your position in the social ladder is all over the world. Even in richer countries with greater equality, people at the top of the social ladder live longer than people at the bottom of the social ladder. And probably a lot of that is to do with stress and psychological stress of being at the bottom of the social ladder rather than simple explanations like access to healthcare. There was a famous study done by the great epidemiologist Australian um, called Sir Michael Marmot. It's a wonderful book you should read called The Health Gap. It's as a Bible of epidemiology, who did a study called the Whitehall study. Whitehall is the government block in London, and this was done over 20 years. And 20 or 30 years ago, the orthodox opinion was there was a higher, if you're at the top of the, if you're a senior civil servant, a senior government officer in Whitehall, you would die younger and have heart attacks because it was the stress of being important and responsible. And Marmot showed in a long study which followed government officers, we call them civil servants, followed them up for 20 years, it was the opposite. It was the people at the bottom, the junior, unimportant people in the government sector who died younger, even though they lived, had a healthier lifestyle as the people at the top. So simply being at the bottom of the social hierarchy is bad for your health. And then all over the world, particularly diabetes, is increasing, maybe not in Ukraine, I don't know, but that again is predicted to use, use up more and more um, healthcare money. That's Ukraine, and as I'll be discussing, if, if you make progress, if people live longer, it is not always entirely a good thing, because 
um, the number of young people, the number of children and people of working age in the population is shrinking. In most of Europe, including Ukraine, fertility rates are below 2.1 babies per woman. And below 2.1 babies per woman, the population will shrink. And of course, the population in Ukraine has been shrinking anyway because of emigration. But the problem in the modern world is you have more and more old people and fewer and fewer young people generating the wealth to pay for them. And the old people cost more and more because cancer is very expensive and dementia is very expensive and uses up lots of medical resources. The cancer charities always show pictures of young children and beautiful young women who have lost all their hair. But in fact, cancer is essentially a disease of old age. These are the figures for the United Kingdom, for Britain. This is age here. And you can see the great majority, men and women, the great majority of cancer cases are in old age. And the problem is we are getting better and better at treating cancer, and it is a very, very expensive business, as I will discuss. An example of that, of what is called targeted therapy, you may have heard of CAR-T therapy, where you take, it is for relapsed um, leukemia, it can also be used for lymphoma, where you take the T cells out of the patient's body, you then, in effect, train them to attack the cancer, grow them in culture millions of times, and then put the white cells back into the patient's body. And it is curing people who before were going to die despite all possible treatment. The problem, well, it does cost about $500,000 per patient. How do you decide whether it's the right thing to do or not? Very difficult. And then dementia, Alzheimer's disease, this is for the United Kingdom, because at the moment in Ukraine, not that many people live into old age, perhaps a little bit less of a problem than in Western Europe. But even if the incidence of dementia reduces, and in fact the incidence of dementia is falling in England, there will still be more and more. That's continuing drop in incidence. That's if the incidence of a disease continues at the present rate. There will be millions of people with dementia. And dementia is again a very expensive disease because of all the nursing care that people require. In England, there is not much medical litigation in Ukraine, but in England, litigation, lawyers and patients suing doctors and hospitals for mistakes has been increasing a great deal. It is now about almost 2% of the National Health Service budget is spent on legal questions, legal problems. And of that money, it's about $2 billion a year. Um, most, well, 40% goes to the lawyers and, and you know, not, not to the patients themselves. So it, again, it is a very big problem in England and also in America. In America, um, yeah, where have we got? In America, in America, it's about 3% of all healthcare cost goes in litigation. May, I think that will become a problem one day in Ukraine, but, but not yet. And there are ways of avoiding it. In Sweden, there is no litigation because there is an automatic government compensation scheme. So perhaps Ukraine should think about that. Now, um, this graph shows healthy life expectancy, which is a bit different from simple life expectancy. It means how long people live in good health and the cost per capita how much money is spent on each per member of the population each year. And you can see there's more or less a straight line connecting how much money is spent on healthcare with how much healthy um, life expectancy there is. But you can see the, si the size of the balls represents how much of the health expenditure goes on in private, in private commercial medicine. And the point about this slide is you can see America is completely off the graph. It spends more money than any other country per capita, 
about $7,000 for every member of the population every year. Most of that is done in the private sector. And yet life expectancy, healthy life expectancy in America is sort of right down there. The same as with countries that spend much, much less on health care. And that shows infant mortality in America compared to other modern countries. America spends more money on health care than any other country in the world, and yet has much higher infant mortality. Um, in fact, and again, with middle-aged, white, non-Hispanic, that's not Spanish, not Latino, white, non-African Americans, um, the mortality, the death rate, is actually increasing. That's the red line, USW. There are about 18,000 deaths every year in America from opioid drug overdoses. So in many ways, it is a country medically in crisis. Everywhere else in the modern world, mortality of middle-aged men is falling because people stop smoking, they exercise more, they, they live longer. You may have come across this American surgeon, the writer Atul Gawande, who is a very good man. He writes some very good books. I'd recommend you all read them, particularly um, Better. And there's another book called Complications. Excellent writer. He wrote an article some years ago in the New Yorker magazine trying to explain why is it that healthcare in America is so expensive compared to the rest of the world, and yet the results on average are so bad. And the answer, which I think most people agree with, is, is because doctors and hospitals are paid a fee for service. The more they do, the more they get paid. Um, and that is why American healthcare is so expensive. And you have this paradox in Ukraine. You have a government health service, but it is in fact a private health service. The doctors are paid under the table, and the more they operate, and the more they do, the more money they make. So you have a strange combination of an underfunded health service, which is actually driving doctors to go in for the same sort of over-treatment as happens in America. Commercial medicine is very expensive. We'll talk more about it later. And as I said, not all these operations and procedures that go on in America are actually necessary. They're not really in patients' interests. By some calculations, it is estimated 30% of the $3 trillion the Amer America spends every year in healthcare is wasted and is actually money thrown away, uh, and for reasons we'll discuss. Now, one reason for this fact that so much unnecessary, excessive treatment can happen, and it's a big problem in Ukraine, is because, of course, medical decisions are all about uncertainty. They are not binary. They're not yes or no. They are not black or white. It is a gray scale between yes, let's say with surgery, yes, almost certainly an operation is necessary, to no, almost certainly an operation is not necessary. But there are many shades of green between those two extremes. Often, it is not clear. Does the patient really need an operation? Um, and the problem here is we have to balance. It is a balancing act. The probability of the operation going well or going badly against the probability of the patient doing badly or doing well without surgery. These are not simple questions. These are very complex questions. They require a lot of knowledge and judgment, not just um, simple factual knowledge. And these medical decisions, I've talked in one of my previous lectures here in Kiev, I won't repeat it in detail now, what psychologists call cognitive biases. We are often, when we have to estimate probability, we often make mistakes. We are biased, we are prejudiced. And if you know, even unconsciously, that by operating you will make $5,000, it will probably encourage you, even unconsciously, to underestimate the, to, the benefits of not operating, to overestimate the risks of not operating. And likewise, you're more likely to underestimate the risks of operating. So these are unconscious prejudices um, which affect us all. And often we don't know really what will happen if we don't operate. 
We know maybe the risks of surgery, but the evidence is not clear what will happen if we don't. And there is a problem, as I will demonstrate to you in a moment, that many doctors, and I would include myself in this until I did a little bit of study about this, we often do not understand simple statistics and probability. And if we don't understand simple statistics and probability, our patients certainly won't either. And then there's the influence of advertising, what some people call the medico-industrial complex. There is a lot of advertising going on, pressure, encouragement by drug companies and equipment companies for doctors to use their equipment. And then, as alas is so much a problem in Ukraine, there is, there is corruption and sometimes actual fraud. Overtreatment. Well, if, for instance, you have a bad chronic headache. Many people have headaches. Should you have an MRI scan or a CT scan? Well, what you should tell the patient is if you, in fact, have no papilledema, no neurological signs, no symptoms of raised intracranial pressure, the probability of a brain scan showing anything significant is remote, much, much less than 1%. And yet all over the world, people are having all these unnecessary brain scans, and it often costs them a lot of money. And that's just one example out of many where we do unnecessary investigations. Now, with medical tests, and I hope you've all been taught this in medical school, we have, if you have a test for a, let's say for HIV, an HIV blood test, you have what are called true positives, which is whether if the patient has HIV, the test will correctly show that. You have true negatives, if the patient does not have HIV, the test will be negative. But then there is the problem of false positives. All tests have false positives to some extent. And you also have false negatives. Sometimes the test will miss whether the patient has HIV or not. Now, here's a question. If a test for a disease has a false positive rate of 9%, in other words, that nine people out of 100 will be shown to have the disease when in fact they don't, and you have the test and it's positive, what is the probability you actually have the disease? Is it um, 91 out of 100, or 45.5 out of 100, or is it 1 out of 10? And this simple question has been shown to many stupid doctors like myself, and most of us get it wrong. But of course, the point is, you can't actually answer that question without knowing whether the disease is very common or not. And it is an example of the way all of us, both as doctors and as patients, we find it difficult to think in percentage terms. If you phrase, if you think about it differently, intuitively, if you have a positive test with a disease which is very common, obviously it's much more likely that you have the disease than if the disease is very rare. And you can show this very simply with two diagrams. Here is a disease with a 1% prevalence. One person out of 100 actually has the disease but it's a test which has a 9% false positive rate. Those are the reds, so you have nine false positives, one true positive. So if you test positive for the disease, in fact, the risk of you having the disease is only one out of 10. If on the other hand, you have a disease where there is, um, it's a 31% probability, um, and you have nine false positives, then it's the other way around. In fact, you're very likely to have the disease. You're, it's a 40 to 9 ratio. And this, is a, all medical, this applies to all medical tests. So a, false, a positive result has to be looked at with great care. And many patients are falsely treated, falsely counseled and advised because the doctors don't understand these very simple statistical principles. For instance, with screening in America, um, less so in Britain, screening for prostate cancer for many years using prostatic-specific antigen was very popular. But scientific studies have now shown that if you had 10,000 men and screened them for 10 years with regular blood tests, you might save one life for every 1,000 men. Is it worth it? With breast cancer, breast cancer screening, this is for patients 
screening with no symptoms, either as well as all of us are. Um, we might have breast cancer, we might have prostate cancer. And in fact, it's been now been shown in, old, in women under the age of 40 years, mammography screening does not help save lives. For older women, it does to a certain extent. And this again is an interesting example. If you read the newspapers, there's oh, 15 to 20% reduction in mortality. You think, gosh, that's a big change. But that is the relative risk to what the underlying risk is. That relative risk, in fact, is an absolute risk reduction of only 0.05%. So again, it's very important when looking at the medical literature to understand the importance of is the absolute risk for us as patients. We're concerned about the absolute risk, not the relative risk. And the newspapers, particularly in England, report these scientific questions really very badly. Always talking about the relative risk because it sounds more exciting and more dramatic. But having said that, some screening certainly is effective. For instance, for cervical cancer and looking for fecal occult bloods in colon cancer. And then with overtreatment, there are unnecessary operations when we know the risks of not operating. I see that often in Ukraine. These are small, my own specialty as a brain tumor surgeon, these are small, benign tumors. That's almost, that is an unnecessary operation. The tumor is very small. Many of these tumors do not get bigger over many, many years. It is wrong to operate on these patients because usually these tumors are discovered by chance. Patients have a headache. They have a brain scan. It does not show the cause of the headache, but it shows one of these common non-symptomatic problems. And it is easy if you work in a commercial health system where you'll be paid thousands of dollars for the operation to operate when really you should do nothing and simply repeat the scan maybe after a year and only operate if the tumor is getting bigger. And most of these tumors do not get bigger. But it's a question of judgment. But nevertheless, you know, there's a lot of unnecessary treatment like that. And if you have commercial health care where doctors are paid more for doing more, they're more likely to operate on these cases which do not need operating on. Um, and then you have over-treatment, potential over-treatment, where we don't actually know the risks of doing nothing. How can you make the right decision about whether surgery is necessary or not, if you don't really know what will happen if you don't operate. This is a condition called a cavernous hemangioma of the brain. It's a serious problem. Surgery is very dangerous for the, because it's in the brain stem on whether there is a high risk to the patient coming to harm in future or not. So that makes the decision making very difficult. And then advertising. This shows the orange ball shows how much money the various international pharmaceutical companies spend on advertising, and the blue ball shows how much they spend on research and development. And with the exception of Roche in Switzerland, all these companies spend much more on advertising than they do in actually creating new drugs. So if you ask the drug companies, why are you charging so much money? for these drugs, they will always say, well, it's so expensive to discover these new drugs. To which you must then reply, well, in that case, why do you spend so much more money advertising drugs than you do on, actually on scientific research to find new drugs? And as you possibly know, the big problem, one of the biggest problems facing us as human beings in the next 20 or 30 years is antibiotic resistance. But the major drug companies are doing virtually no research into finding no new antibiotic has been discovered for 25 years. There are now some organisms which are resistant to all the antibiotics, including colchicine. Um, why are the drug companies not spending money um, looking for new antibiotics? Because there's no profit in it. The profit's in cancer. Cancer is a very profitable disease it's a disease of affluent countries, of elderly populations, and you have these very, very expensive biological drugs. So this is an example of where if you leave, if you leave scientific medicine to private commercial companies, it's a bad idea. This needs governments to step in, to insist that research is done. 
because modern medicine, as you know, depends entirely on antibiotics. And I'm sure in Ukraine, as in Britain, the problem of resistance is becoming bigger and bigger all the time to find antibiotics at work. And then the medical industrial complex, well, advertising in America, the drug companies can actually advertise directly to patients. So patients will go to doctors and say, I want this particular drug. And the doctor will, vote, doctor will lend us or sign a prescription, even though he probably knows the drug is expensive or not very good. Um, there's a sort of semi-corrupt relationship between drug companies and equipment companies and the medical profession. You know, they, they fund continuing medical education, they pay for conferences and meetings and training courses. But they, they, and they give free samples to doctors. Um, then you have sexy sales force for, in, in spinal surgery. There is a lot of metal work to be put into people's spines, um, often unnecessarily. And I always tell my trainees in London that the prettier and sexier the girls selling the equipment, probably the less valuable, the less useful it is. Um, now, you may, have, you may not have heard of this book. It was only published recently by an English journalist. Quite a lot of it is about Ukraine and corruption in the medical system in Ukraine. Um, a lot of it also is about the way much of the money which has been stolen from Ukraine, from the Ukrainian public by some people, um, has then gone to London and the British banks, to my shame, have been laundering money stolen from Ukrainians by people in positions of power in Ukraine. So what about corruption? Well, the commonest form of corruption is overpricing of government contracts. Um, bribes are paid to the members of the government who will actually choose between um, different contracts. Um, kickbacks to doctors, where doctors will be paid by the equipment manufacturers to use their particular piece of equipment or spinal implant, and then the doctor is given under the table a percentage of that money. This, again, is money stolen from the government, stolen from the public. And it happens in Europe. In Greece, for instance, this is standard practice that the doctors are all paid kickbacks. It is very much against the law, and certainly in, in England and Scandinavia, um, it does not happen. But in many other countries, it does. All this is theft. Um, and then, of course, you have the problem in Ukraine, where the doctors are paid so little by the state, they have to depend upon payments under the table from their patients and families. I don't really regard that as corruption as such, but it is a big problem, as you all know. This is a big problem you all face. Um, the point about the pharmaceutical companies is um, we need them. We need the drug companies. We need um, equipment manufacturers. But they are businessmen. They are not altruists. We are supposed to be altruists as doctors. But for them, the patient's are a means to the end of making a profit. The patient is a way of making money. They're not actually concerned primarily with helping patients. Whereas as doctors, we should only be concerned with what's good for our patients and to a much lesser extent what is good for our, our bank balance and our money. So there are many different sorts of healthcare systems. There are commercial systems, although in America it's very complicated and there are some examples like the Cleveland Clinic and the Mayo Clinic and the Kaiser Permanente, which are run on sort of not-for-profit principles, and the doctors are on fixed salaries rather than being paid for everything, every item of work they do. And then there are hybrid systems, in fact, like in Britain, where most people are treated by the National Health Service, but there is in parallel a private system as well, and patients have the choice usually if they have private health insurance, to go to the private system. And most doctors, like myself, until I retired from private practice some years ago, I would work maybe 50 hours a week for the government and 10 hours a week in my own private practice. And then the systems can be tax-funded directly, as in Britain and Scandinavia, or you can have compulsory insurance, as you have in Germany, Holland, and... Um, and, and France. Many, many different ways of doing things. And obviously one of the big problems in Ukraine, trying to reform the healthcare system, you're trying to create something 
really from the bottom up, from scratch, and it's very difficult. And you have to look at all the different systems and try to work out what might work best in Ukraine. What are the advantages of private health care? Well, it's more responsive to patients. There's nothing like waving a $100 bill in front of doctors to make them jump and investigate you quickly and smile politely at you, perhaps. Um, there are no waiting lists. There's no queuing. The doctors will do things quickly and promptly because it's a competitive system and they want the money. And it's profitable, so this is a problem in Ukraine. On the whole, the private hospitals I've seen have been much better equipped than the government hospitals because private practice in Ukraine generates more money um, than in the government sector. What are the disadvantages of private health care? Well, as I said, over-treatment is a big problem. If you don't have very high ethical standards, it's very easy to doctors to drift towards running medicine as a business rather than as a service for their patients. Uh, and I said the doctors are at risk of being corrupted by the fact there is so much money to be made because what could be more precious for us than our health? Desperate patients will pay anything, particularly desperate parents if their child is sick as I'll, and I'll tell you a story about that in a moment. It's difficult to regulate if you have lots and lots of separate private clinics coming up, and doctors do need regulating. We need controlling. And, of course, it's bad for poor people. It's, if everybody is wealthy, not a problem. Like in Switzerland, most of the, much of the system there is private, but Switzerland is a wealthy country with low levels of inequality. But it's certainly more expensive, and in my own opinion, it would be a bad model for Ukraine to follow if more and more of health care is provided by private clinics, despite their potential advantages. And it is disastrous for postgraduate training. All over the world, most training is done in the government sector, free of charge, which is why patients will accept they will not necessarily be operated or treated by the senior doctor. But again, poor old Ukraine, double problem. You go to the government hospital, but you pay the doctor money, and you do not want to be operated upon by the junior doctors. So there's, as far as I can see, there is no proper postgraduate training in Ukraine at all, other than training the professor's son. When Ukrainian colleagues have come to work with me in London, they're all amazed by the difference in the relationship I have and my colleagues have with our trainees compared to Ukraine. We discuss everything. We are teaching all the time. Every time we operate, we'll be discussing it, we'll be teaching. For us, for most countries, except perhaps poor old Ukraine, you know, to be a doctor is to teach. You're teaching the next generation simultaneously to teaching your own patient. And that ethical philosophy seems to have been lost in many places. I'm sure there are exceptions to that in Ukraine, but it really is one of the biggest differences I see when I come here between working in, in England and America and coming to Ukraine. What are the advantages of state health care? Well, equality in principle. Poor people get the same treatment as rich people, and that on the whole is true, and it's true in England, although it's never entirely true. So if you live in London next to one of the big famous hospitals, you will get world-class treatment free of charge. If you live up in the north of the country in one of the poorer areas, you get free treatment, but it probably won't be quite as good. But it's still not bad. It's cost-effective. There's less over-treatment. And in fact, in many international studies of healthcare systems, it's systems like Britain's National Health Service, which always come out, come out as being the best value for money, the most cost-effective. You get the best results for the least expenditure. And you get better postgraduate training, although not in Ukraine. Um, what are the disadvantages of state health care? Well, it's less responsive to patients. You can treat patients rudely or badly, and they still have to put up with you. They have, little, they have less choice. Um, and doctors can be corrupted by power, not by money, except in Ukraine, where you're paid under the table. Um, but doctors can be corrupted by power, and there's no financial consequences to treating patients rudely or badly. And it can be very bureaucratic, and much as I believe 
in, in the national health service system in my country, it is becoming increasingly bureaucratic um, because the politicians are always trying to keep the costs down so they don't have to put taxation up. And it's underfinanced. Taxpayers don't want to pay tax. Um, as the great Benjamin Franklin said, there are only two certainties in life, death and taxation. And the more you think about that, the more true that is. And I would add, you can't have less of one without more of the other. Less tax, more death. Less death, more tax. They're inversely related. Now, the, the, the very clever, funny American writer, H.L. Mencken, I love this quote, for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. And the problems in Ukrainian healthcare are very, very complex. And they're complex because of years of Soviet misrule, because of an economy which is struggling, because of the war, because of deep-seated cultural ethical attitudes, which are very difficult to change. Um, now, an important principle about complex problems is what economists call trade-offs, which means very simply, you often can't have more of one thing without less of the other. The Ukrainian government under Dr. Suplun has made remarkable progress in saving money with procurement by putting procurement out to independent organizations, such as a service called the Crown, Crown Agents, so that the bureaucrats in the Ministry of Health can no longer take bribes to influence them in how they choose to um, award, buy drugs and award contracts. And that has saved millions of dollars. And I hope you all know that. It's a remarkable achievement. But, so it might be better it saved money, but it means less money for the corrupt bureaucrats. And they're unhappy. No, they don't like it. Um, not surprisingly. How much should doctors be paid? Well, you will all become deeply depressed when you see this graph. Um, that specialist on the left general practitioners on the right. Um, is that thing? Yeah. And it's in Holland. Amazing. Quarter of a million dollars. And the only work of 48-hour week. Lucky chaps. Um, but again, drops all the way down. Poland, 20,000. But the average over all these countries is about $100,000 a year for specialists and, and rather less for general practitioners. Now, of course, it's very difficult in Ukraine to calculate what people pay, are paid because so much of it is, is in the black economy, under the table. But according to this figure I found, and my friends tell me it's probably accurate, it's about sort of about $5,000 $5, a year, which you can't live off, obviously. And how, how, how is the government going to change that? I don't know, but it, it's a big problem and very difficult. So these are ethical questions in many ways. As I said before, you have to ask yourselves as young doctors, you are the future of Ukraine. You are the future of Ukrainian healthcare. It is easy for me as a, as a wealthy Westerner coming from a very privileged background and privileged hospital system to tell you what to do. And I'm not telling you what to do. I, I'm not doing that at all. I'm only asking questions. But you have to ask yourselves, is medicine a vocation or is it a business? Obviously, it's a bit of both. But where will you be on that, on that balance between those two extremes? For me, and I hope for all of you, ultimately, having patients who are grateful for lives I have saved is a much greater reward than driving a big Rolls Royce or something like that, or having a big home. But that's a personal, personal preference. How much should good Ukrainian doctors charge at the moment, given you have to ask patients and their families for money? I don't know the answer to that, but that's something you need to think about. And how can you avoid over-treatment? Well, we can talk about that in a moment. Here's the story. This is a child I saw last year in Lviv, in the children's hospital. He had suffered a, a month earlier, he had suffered a severe head injury. His brain scan looked terrible. He looked terrible. He will probably die. There is no possibility of his making a good recovery. He has suffered a terrible head injury. He's had several operations already, which in, in Europe, in England, we certainly would not have done because we know the evidence is they, don't, they would not help. It was very difficult. My colleagues in the hospital said, Henry, you know, you, 
You come from the West. Uh, we've been trying to tell the parents the situation is hopeless. Maybe they'll believe you. So I sat down and had a long and very painful conversation with an interpreter trying to explain to these desperate parents that their child really had no real prospect of recovery. He might survive, but if he survives, he'll be left what we call in a persistent vegetative state. In fact, the child showed um, that he was extending to pain, you know, one of the primitive neurological reflexes. And we know in adults, that's a 95% mortality, and in children, that's a 50% mortality. And of the 50 who don't die, they're all left terribly disabled. So I, I told the parents that, and I did not enjoy the conversation, nor did they. And I then went away down to Odessa, in fact, and, and was working a bit there. And when I came back a few days later, I was told another, neuro, another neurosurgeon from a different hospital had come and looked at me, the parents had asked him to come. And he said, oh, he needs another operation. He did a complete nonsense operation, technically. And he said, oh, there's a, um, there's a cyst in the posterior fossa, which there isn't. It's just an enlarged fourth ventricle. And he sort of did an operation to remove bone from the back of the child's head. Complete rubbish. And I'm told he probably charged $1,000 to the parents for it. It made, made no difference to the child. So I was left with this. I was, I was angry, but I was puzzled as well. I thought, well, is, is, what, if it's, what was going through this surgeon's head? Did he think, stupid parents, I'll make money from them? Did he think, well, I feel sorry for the parents, but I'll ask them for some money? Or did he genuinely think the operation might help? Which is not true, but maybe he was just dreadfully ignorant. I don't know the answer. Maybe it was all three. All I know is the evidence, medical evidence, is absolutely clear. The operation he did was nonsense, complete nonsense. And I'm afraid I've seen many examples of that over the years in Ukraine. And it is a combination of poor education and commercial commercial medical practice. And it's not limited to Ukraine. This is another child I saw in Lviv with a terrible tumor called a DPIG, diffuse or DIPG, a diffuse intrapontine glioma. These are fatal. You can treat the child with steroids and radiation. And they're all dead within a year. And there is plenty of recognized scientific evidence that is the case. There is no effective treatment. And I've seen many, it's a rare tumor, but I've seen several children in Ukraine with these tumors and desperate, desperate parents. I understand my own son had a brain tumor, so I know what these parents are feeling. Um, and they come often with things they've printed from the internet. And this is from Mexico, advocating intra-arterial chemotherapy. It's um, $12,000, and you have the bank account. <laughs> The bank details. This is rubbish. We know that. If you look on the internet, it's quite clear. This treatment does not work. It has been tried. There have been scientific trials, and it doesn't work. And yet, again, are these doctors here, are they evil? Are they cynical? Are they just stupid? I don't know. But they're making a lot of money. Poor parents from all over the world read this and raise hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to Mexico, and the children all die nevertheless. So these problems are not, not unique to Ukraine by any, any way. How can we avoid over-treatment? Well, obviously, honesty and integrity is a very important part of it. Know yourselves. Know, know thyself, as the Greek philosopher said. Be honest with yourself. Now, I must make it what is really in the patient's best interest, not, not what is in my interests. Don't be greedy. Very important principle. Simple rule for all doctors. Don't be greedy. We are doctors. We're here to serve patients. Yes, we need to make money, but not too much. Um, knowledge of the medical evidence, very important. There's a, particularly now with the internet, the internet has changed things profoundly. The senior professors no longer have a monopoly of information. If you know where to look on the internet, you can find a lot of information as to what treatment is proven by research um, to work and what treatment does not work. It only took me 10 minutes on the internet to see that intra-arterial chemotherapy is nonsense for children with that particular tumour. 
There is this organisation which started in Britain but is now international, although I don't think you have access to it in Ukraine. You may have heard of it, called the Cochrane Collaboration, which is an international collaboration to review all the time all the evidence, the best evidence about how to treat patients in accordance with, with good evidence and true science. So that information is there on the internet. You can find it if you look for it. So the internet, I said, the people in power no longer have a monopoly of information. And just as Maidan, Yuri Maidan, and also the failed, unsuccessful Sp Arab Spring a few years ago, a lot of this is to do with social media and is made possible by the internet, and it applies to medicine as well. <laughs> as I said, I, I met Dr. Saprun yesterday, and had a long conversation with her. I've read quite a lot about what she's trying to do. I think it's very fine. I've been coming to... I know she's very unpopular with many people, people who think they will lose money because of what she's trying to do, but it will benefit. Some people will lose money, other people will benefit. All change, all reform. There are winners and losers. Um, and I've been coming to Ukraine for many years, very challenged, excited, but very frustrated to see how little really, how little att real attempts were being made to make things better. So love her or hate her, she and her team are trying to make things better. You may not like it, but at least they're trying to change things, as far as I can see, for the first time in many, many years. And I, I was very impressed by what she is trying to do. What are the problems of Ukrainian healthcare, to, to summarise the end? Well, there's corruption, particularly in procurement. There are fee-for-service payments to doctors, although under the table. There is very poor postgraduate education. These are complex, difficult problems. As H.L. Mencken said, there are no simple answers. There are no quick answers. Nobody can suddenly change things. You can't suddenly become as relatively efficient and non-corrupt as my own country, or like some of the Scandinavian countries. This takes a long time. But the point is this, now an autocratic medical professional, these damn autocratic professors, I don't like them. Um, <laughs> and there are probably too many hospitals, very difficult to amalgamate hospitals, but this again reflects the Soviet legacy of quantity but no quality. Lots and lots of big hospitals, but they're largely empty, just like the shops in the Soviet time. And poverty, because Ukraine is not a, not a wealthy country, although it could be. If you think of what's been achieved in Poland over the last 30 years, why has Ukraine failed to develop in the way that Poland has developed? And the war does not help, although it, in many ways it has brought Ukraine together. Putin has unintentionally made Ukraine a more unified nation but obviously war is very expensive and it makes everything much more difficult. But if we're not optimistic, I've always felt optimistic about Ukraine, crazily enough. Um, if we are not optimistic about the future, we won't try to make things better. So in a sense, we have a moral duty to be optimistic and to try to make things better. And I suppose my own so little sort of way, by coming here for a few weeks every year for so many years, I've been trying to help a little bit to set an example in some ways. Um, and the fact there are so many of you here tonight, I like to think means that you're, you're interested in what I have to say. Because the future belongs to you, to the young people, not to the old farts like me, not to the senior professors. The future is yours, and if you don't fight for it, you will not have a good future. And it is so important you understand that. I, I was at Maidan on many, several occasions where I'm wearing my blue and yellow ribbon, um, and I was very, very proud to be a little part of that uh, and to witness that. And I hope that unlike the Orange Revolution, which all fell apart, I hope that Yuri Maidan continues to change Ukraine and particularly in, in healthcare. And having said that, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you.